Jim. Um, I am thrilled to introduce Martha Apple today. She's an associate professor in biological sciences at uh, Montana Tech in Butte. She just had a pretty spectacular sabbatical that I'm sure she's going to tell us about <laughs> since it's all these places. Yeah, yeah. Um, her bachelor's and master's were actually from the University of Montana in botany and geology. Geography. And geography, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And then she has a PhD in biological sciences from the University of Rhode Island. Her postdoc was actually with the University of Nevada, but in Corvallis. Oh, I did for those two different them. things. Oh, okay. One was, I didn't track that very well, but she okay. can explain that better than I can. But one of them was at the US EPA College in Corvallis. Lab, Corvallis. Corvallis. Yeah. yeah, which I found interesting. Yeah. So Martha can take this away. Okay, well, thank you, Martha. Nice. You love the word names. I know, it's so much fun. Okay, well, here we all are, and I want to tell you a few things about projects I've been involved with recently. Um, I've been working with the effects of climate change on plants for a while. That's what I did my postdoctoral research on. And um, over the last uh, five or six years, I've started working with um, the effects of climate change on alpine plants. So. Uh, one of these projects is the Snowfield Plant Project, and this is current and ongoing, and it takes place at Glacier National Park, and we're studying snowfields. I think I'm sort of standing in front of the picture. This one's more, the ratio is more like what it is in real life. Here we are at the Sia Pass Snowfield um, at Glacier Park, one of the Sia Pass Snowfields. This is a vast snowfield that shows up on topo maps. Some of you have been there. Um, this is my son, Charlie Apple, who went with me and he thought it would be a great place to set up a super G course for skiing. It's, it's that big. Um, anyway, am I going the right way with this? Yes, I am. Okay. So one reason to look at snowfield plants at Glacier National Park as we've got retreating glaciers at the park and also retreating snowfields. And these are documented in via repeat photography. And this is from um, Dan Fagery's group up at USGS or No Rock, since we're Northern Rockies. And using this picture that TJ Heilman took in 1938, we had no idea this was going to become so widely viewed and part of this series. Um, you see we've got a pretty uh, cohesive glacier right there, extensive glacier. And then look, 1981, we have an iceberg lake. Oh, that's very cool. There are icebergs. But what it means is we've got a melting glacier. Um, right there, Dan Fagri, and then my friend and colleague, Lindsay Bengston went back in 2009 and took that picture. And she also kayaked through there. So very interesting journey, probably, to see that up close. Um, oh, sorry. If you want to read more about it, um, this is a paper. It's, it's been around a while. It's from Bioscience. Um, Holland Bagri modeled climate-induced glacier change in Glacier National Park. So there's a group studying this change in glaciers pretty um, intensively. Um, so what we looked at were measuring impacts to rare plants, um, peripheral, peripheral, excuse me, Arctic alpine plants at the edges of permanent snowfields slash glaciers that are receding due to climate change in Glacier National Park. A very long title. Um, this work is what we started in the summer of 2012. It's funded through the RMCESU program that funds research projects in national parks. Um, U of M folks have a, there's a site there at, at U of M where they administrate these. Um, anyway, peripheral Arctic alpine plants are those that are on, in this case, the southern edge or the southern periphery of their ranges. And they're fairly rare in Glacier Park. Um, not some of them are only in Glacier Park, but some of them are um, found elsewhere. Um, receding at the edges of permanent snowfields and glaciers. So right along the edges of snowfields, you've got a, a changing edge, an ephemeral, um, ephemeral habitat that's going to change throughout a growing season. 
movement. And this edge may shift more quickly with rapidly melting um, snow fields. And this is a picture of one of the <clears throat> excuse me, rare Arctic alpine plants. This is growing in a, a rocky field near the Sia Pass snow field. And um, this is the pygmy poppy, or papaver pygmaceae. Um, I thought we were never going to find the rare plants. How do we find a list? members of a list of 10 to 15 rare plants in this huge national park. Well, go to the end of the Sia Pass snowfield and along its edges, and you'll find a lot of them. Um, which brings me to this. Rare plants are common where you find them. This is a paper by Peter Lessica and Yurkowitz and Krohn in 2006. And in my experience, it's true. You're going along, and all of a sudden, there's one, there's another. Um, the idea is that they are common where you find them because they recently evolved, they're recently speciated there, so they haven't exactly spread out from there. Um, and of course, there are other factors such as habitat limitations and so on. Um, but how, do they, what, how do they get there? They, they speciated from other plants, which may not be in the picture anymore. So. So they may have relatives, and they may have gotten there from seed dispersal. So many, many factors would, would influence how they had gotten there. So what did we do at the snowfields in 2012? Well, we started a fine-scale study of, um, and hopefully what will be long-term monitoring, of snowfield plant diversity and um, distribution and abundance, and we set up some matched or paired transects at the toe and lateral edges of snow fields at Sia Pass, Vegan Pass, and Logan Pass, also um, um, Preston Park, and um, um, the Logan Pass ones are at Mount Clements. And each of these is 50 meters, and then along the transects we have um, intervals every five meters where we set down two one meter squared quadrats and in these we looked at plant species presence, um, abundance, percent cover, and included in that is going to be diversity and species richness because we know which ones are there. And we're looking at distance from the edge and we mark the ends of each transect with um, rock cairns and put little pieces of metal in them so you can find them with the metal detector um, that some botanists known as the Gens, Jen Hintz and Jen Eisebrook have and for going out and botanizing and finding things again. Um, and then we located rare Arctic alpine plants and we had a list of these that we looked for and found many of them, not all of them. And these are my two very um, adventurous and capable and bright students, D.J. Moritz, um, a math major at Montana Tech, and Alice Martin, who is at um, U of M. She's a biology major over there with an emphasis on botany. And there we are setting up one of these transects. So here's a map that I lifted off of Google, and it shows Mount Clements, if you've ever been up to Logan Pass and been on that, that boardwalk trail to Hidden Lake, it's a pretty famous trail. Um, maybe not as many of you have been there, because it's closer to Yellowstone around here. But anyway, at that trail, if you go along that trail, you can find um, our study site on Mount Clements. And that was the first one we set up, a very long transect that goes from a snowfield to tree line but it doesn't go vertically up to tree line. It goes across to tree line. And then Pegan Pass, we hiked into that, and that's right on the divide. Um, Preston Park is a smaller, flatter snowfield, and Sia Pass, which you've already seen. Um, anyway, so here's the snowfield near Sia Pass. It's at 7,800 meters. Uh, 7,800 feet, excuse me. Excuse me, that would be a high snowfield. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> You need supplemental oxygen or something. And here's a pond right here. And this is characteristic of the toe of a snowfield. It's melting. 
this is summer of 2012, which was very hot. And even if it hadn't have been very hot, there is a lot of um, solar energy up above tree line in an alpine environment. So you're going to have some pond formation and some melting off. OK, and this, oh, darn it. OK, the pointer is, is this. OK. Um, Hmm. I will just use my hand because I don't want to waste too much of your time while I fill around. This is DJ standing looking out from right here. So this gives you an idea of how big the snow field is. This this picture is from up on the top of um, Sae Pass, and the field where we found a lot of the rare plants is right here. I imagine that we find some more there and there. And then there's a rocky ridge over to this side where there are a lot more. So many different microhabitats around there. Um, and this is the Preston Park snowfield, which we were interested in because it's relatively flat and it's small and it's right near the trees. Um, one thing about getting into those sites, um, you have to wait until the snow, you don't have to, you could ski in or snowshoe in, but logistically, it's a lot less complex to wait until the snow has melted off until you can go in. So what we don't know is where was this in June, for example, and what plants were there. But since we've got a fair amount of plants right here, I imagine that the snow field, per se, doesn't extend much farther backwards, but it does extend forward for that one, um, just based on topography. And this is another view of Preston Park. We've got a transect over to the um, subalpine fir trees. And then that's um, Sibaldia procumbens in the rose family, which is pretty common um, at snowfields. It's not a snowfield. Uh, it's not, it is a snowfield plant. It's not one of the rare plants. Um, and then this is a mixture of Carex and other species. OK. Then here's the Pegan Pass snowfield. This was closest to a trail, um, a trail that you can take from Sae Bend over to Mini Glacier. And it's also the Continental Divide Trail. So it's fairly well traveled. So this is probably the most human influenced. But I think many people stay on the trail, although there is some wandering up there. Um, so just to give you an idea of what that looks like. And here's a transect five meters from the snow's edge. And we have Oxyria digina, the mountain sorrel, and Epilobium. And these are little plants, not oh, spectacular wildflowers of glacier. They're just little plants that you find over and over again right near the edges of snow fields. They can come up very quickly in days of snow melt. Um, they're just ready. And they're not very structurally complex and that they don't have a lot of extensive stems and things to support. It's little leaves that are pretty thin, um, not a lot of xeromorphic characteristics that are immediately obvious. Um, but that's what it looks like, um, some rocks, some talus. And then what we did, this is from that same transect, was actually this is from all the transects, is make a table of where we found which plants. Did we find it at, as in, did we find anemones at Mount Clemens? Did we find them above the Sexton Glacier? And so on, just so we have a tally of how to find these if we, if we go back and what was there then. And then this is percent cover classes um, of the different species every five meters from um, from the edge of the snowfield, the edge as it was when we were there. So that's going to be different. Um, and percent cover is pretty low until you get out to about the 40, 45 meter phase at this snowfield. And this is about where we start seeing lichens on the rocks, right there, right around there. Um, it's also where. We started visibly seeing soil. It doesn't mean it's not under the rocks. Um, and we got, we started seeing more plants 
or a greater percentage cover of plants as we went up. And there's no snow on this particular one because we started from the edge. So, but we could conceivably have had a snow, a little isolated snow patch right about there or something, depending on how it melted in the topography. And then this is um, species cover classes um, with distance from the, the snowfield's edge, and we saw greater species richness. Um, more higher percent cover as we went farther away from the snow. Closer to the snow, though, over and over again, we saw Oxyria, Epilobium, um, Carex species, and once in a while, Ranunculus, a few others. But this pattern is essentially what we found close to the snow field. And then when we got over to here, we started finding the more um, cushion types of plants, um, saxifrages and so on, um, that are larger plants. Um, so you can see that how this changes as we went along. And then one part of this story is that animals are standing by willing to eat these plants. And here's a, a marmot running up from its little rocky fort there. I guess that's its home. And um, it was eating the oxyria. These animals probably see many, many humans, so they're they're pretty, they're on the glacier park payroll essentially. Um, <laughs> so they come running up and um, eat oxyria and uh, let's see, you can see these. Oh darn! I'm not the pointer. Sorry, got carried away. Um, you can see the flowers there and um, starting to make seeds, and then they eat it and they. Um, likely are agents of seed dispersal. And your question about how do these plants get their seed dispersers probably have a lot to do with it. Um, and then eat these plants. And then in the background of that picture, you can see another plant that we often saw. It's Phacelia hastata. Um, and it's, that was another one that was often found at snowfields. So anyway, my point is that animals have a lot to do with which plants live near the snowfields um, on beyond whether a plant can withstand the environment of the snowfield without considering the animals. So, um, and then this is at the Mount Clements transect. This is a ways away from the snow where it was pretty. Sorry, I can't talk. Let me take a sip of this. Intensively covered by plants by the time we got this far, which was something like 90 meters away. Um, but mountain goats will come up and just chomp and chomp and chomp. It's, it's essentially a meadow that they graze upon. So I think it would be interesting to study that in detail. Which plants do they, do they have a preference for which specific plants? How quickly do they re sprout? Do they re sprout? Um, are they, what seeds are they distributing? and so on. So that is probably going to have a lot to do with whether we get changes in plant communities with retreating snowfields. Um, just to give you an idea about this, this changing edge, life on a changing edge sort of thing, um, this is the false asphodel or tophelia. Um, and it lives down on the edges of these um, snowmelt ponds right here. And so it's not directly living in the snowfield, but it is likely influenced by the snowfields and the, the hydrology of when the snowfields are melting, how much they melt, and, and so on, and possibly some nutrients that are coming down the hill with the melting snow. Now, the arrow that's pointed towards the rock in the upper right picture is where we started our transect. And this is the one we started on um, with the idea that, oh, that's the middle of a snowfield. It's going to be there all summer. It's late July, early August. <laughs> Guess what? Two weeks later, all gone. So we went back, and after a while, this little snow bridge right here, or not snow bridge, but channel right here was gone hiked up over here and found this primo snowfield behind the um, 
Mount Clements Moraine. And in summer 2014, that's one of our places where we're going to go because I think we can look at functional traits of plants and other aspects of them in more detail because that's the easiest site to get to. It's like a one mile hike from a parking lot, which isn't that glamorous in terms of mountain research, but it's doable. So, um, but to sum it up, at snow field edges, we found rocks and scree and meltwater and clay and gravel and so on. It varied with topography. Um, usually this group of species in one combination or another, Oxyria, Cephalidia, Epilobium, and Phacelia, within days of snow melt, away from the snow field edges is where we found more of the rare Arctic alpine plants. For example, Aquilegia jonesii, the Jones columbine, was, which is, has a very striking deep blue flower. And um, xeromorphic cushion plants, um, Silene acaulis, the moss campion, which takes a while to get going. These things can live for many decades, and they're not really snowfield edge plants per se. They're, they're a different um, way of life. So this is a very common circumboreal alpine plant. So what's the take home message from this? Part of the study, plant communities are likely to change with receding snowfields and glaciers. Okay, so snowfield study is to be continued in 2014, and we have the goal of looking, trying to narrow down um, species differences. I'm sorry, narrow down the snowfield edges. And, and when I was at U of M, I talked to some people about um, images that they already had and remote sensing data and so on, which will help a lot. Um, looking at species differences and looking at um, plant functional traits. And depending on how many students will go with, we can maybe start looking at some of these animal plant interactions and so on. Um, next, I want to tell you about the Gloria project, which is something I'm involved with. And Gloria stands for Global Observation Research Initiative in Alpine Environments. And it was started in Austria in oh, circa 1999 by Jörg Grabher and Harald Pauli and Michael Gottfried and some others. And it started with one site, one glorious summit on one of the Alps, and has spread to 116 active target regions all over the world. And these guys have been at it for a while and have resurveyed these, their glorious sites in Europe three times by now. And so they've gotten some very interesting results that show changes in species distribution in European mountains, changes greater in southern European mountains where there's more temperature stress. And they've recently published, the whole European group has recently published this in um, Science and Nature, respectively. Um, but what a glorious site is, is it's called a summit region, and you have four sub-summits along an elevational gradient. And at each one, you take extensive plant surveys and at the cardinal directions in north, south, east, and west. And then you have a temperature logger, um, one of those little hobo data loggers in, inside, of the, inside of the ground. I'm losing it. Anyway, um, that you have buried in, in the soil approximately five centimeters below the soil. And then you come up and swap them out every so often, um, replace them or, or read them, depending on which kind of sensor you have. And three by three um, meter squares are called quadrant clusters. And you take your one meter square surveys in the corner squares that are blacked out, and the gray squares are somewhere to stand while you're doing all this. And then you look at which plants are found in the summit area sections. So you do this at tree line um, and then continuously up as high as you can go on your particular mountain. And we set up one in the Pioneer Mountains in 2008. Um, part of it's on Mount Fleecer, and then the high summit is on Mount Keokirk. Um, and these are, this is an idea of the temperature graphs. Well, actually, these are the actual temperature graphs from 2008 to 2011, it's minus 30 and plus 30 C on the y-axis. And 
On the upper left graph, you can see a flatter line during the winters, and that's because that's a late snow lie area. And then on the um, lower right, which is the west cardinal direction, it's a high rocky summit that gets a lot of, um, presumably gets a lot of wind, and it snow doesn't accumulate there and you get more temperature variation. So here's an idea of some of the flora at the Keokirk High site. This is um, Eritricheum nanum, the blue flower there. And then here we are, this is last summer when we were resurveying it. I had some visitors from Norway, Zveri Lundemo and Jarli Inga Holten, um, who came with on our expedition. They're I don't know if they'd ever seen one of our unmaintained Montana roads before, but they found out firsthand what it was like. Kind of a white knuckler. Anyway, um, so we hiked up here. And then this is Kendra McQuillan, who's in a journalism environmental, environmental journalism program at U of M. And she wrote a report on us and, and for her, a story on us for, and for part of her graduate work. So we had these three visitors and then there's our three meter squared quadrat right there where we were busy measuring it. So that's what our site looks like. Um, so within the Gloria project, a group of us decided, well, let's look at plant functional traits to get an idea of which plants are likely to uh, survive climate change and in particular, what do they do if the mountains are warming up? Do we lose some of them because they lose too much water? They're not mycorrhizal, what have you. Um, so what, first of all, what are plant functional traits? Essentially just about any trait that a plant has is going to influence its function at some level. Um, but in particular, we're interested in um, traits that we can use to simplify comparisons across regions within Gloria, because this is this um, very large program. Um, and the holy grail question is, which traits or suites of traits will be important to climate change? So we don't know for sure yet, but we're, this is what our research is on right now. Um, and there's the idea that functional traits that are influenced by temperature and precipitation might be um, valuable predictors of responses. And so the idea is to use these traits in the Gloria database and make in situ comparisons for a predictive model. And so far we've gotten New Zealand's Gloria site and Montana's and Scotland's involved with this. So um, where do you get plant functional data? Some of it is from the field and involves much traipsing and data gathering and so on. And some of it's pretty um, invasive to sample. Are you going to look at um, root architecture, for example? That's going to be very different than saying what color is the flower, which is pretty easy to discern. Um, so some of them are from lab work. Some of them are um, from the literature. Um, this paper by Perez Hargundigay, I hope I pronounced that last name right, um, is a very nice compendium of how plant functional trait questions are asked and, and answered and what, what are some things to look at. So if you're interested, I recommend looking at that um, paper. And you can also find them in Flora's and, and Herbaria, Svalbard flora in Norway, um, the TRI database, those are some, some of the Jepsons from California, um, UBC. There are a lot of them out there that will set, tell you particulars about plants, but they're not going to be site specific. They're more, these are the average data that we find. Um, so a list of plant functional traits, there are many possible functional traits to consider. Um, and you can go on and on. What's your favorite trait? This, this is a three slide long list. And these are some that we've come up with within the Gloria group. Um, and I can send you this list if you're interested in this. Um, but uh, clonal reproduction, what will that do if, if a plant's able to uh, 
move easily to a new habitat, um, a microhabitat via conal reproduction. Um, how long do the seeds live in the seed bed? Um, does it have, how does it respond to grazing? Are the leaves evergreen? Things like that. Um, second page, habitat specialization. Where does it currently live? That could be used uh, mycorrhizal status, physiological tolerance ranges. So those, those are generally not that easy to go out and measure. You know, each suite of those might be a master's thesis, for example. Um, but you can find a lot of this from the literature. Um, and then what are the leaves? Like I already said, that successional status, flowers and phenology, pollinators, seed dispersers, all of that is in there. Um, so what I did was go to New Zealand and talk to Sir Alan Mark, who is a um, world-renowned alpine botanist about this. I was going to New Zealand anyway, just happened to be in the neighborhood. So I had the good fortune to go to the University of Otago and meet with him and go on a field trip, a series of field trips. Um, and here's our group on the left. That's Christian Corner. Um, a, an eco plant ecophysiologist, and he's from Europe. And then we had Michael Samways from South Africa. And then in the center, right near the 33, that's Sir Alan Mark. He was knighted because of his conservation efforts in saving Lake Manapuri from being flooded by a hydroelectric power station that was going in. And that's that was pivotal in getting the conservation movement um, to amplify in New Zealand. And then Mark Cochran from South Dakota, Bill from Australia, and Diego from Spain, who just finished his master's. Anyway, we went all over the place in on the South Island and went up through the native beech forest. These are um, nothophagus trees. And then we got to tree line. And these guys have both recently published books, um, Alpine Tree Lines by Christian Corner and Above the Tree Line by Alan Mark. And Christian Corner's uh, work to sum it up, he's written a whole book on it, so it obviously says more than this, but is by putting temperature sensors around at tree lines all over the world, he's found that they're found between 5 and 7 degrees C average soil temperature year-round. So that's the take-home message. And then above the tree line is all about different life forms that live in the alpine zone. So here are some of those life forms. Um, this bird is a Takahe, T-A-K-A-H-E. And it was thought extinct. Um, but then rediscovered in the Murchison Mountains of Fiordland National Park. And it's a flightless rail. And there is a lot of trouble in New Zealand with introduced mammals, such as stoats and weasels and ferrets and possums and rats and those types of creatures that will eat the native birds that can't fly um, and also can get to their nests and their eggs. And so the Takahi has this pair of pliers for its beak, as you can see there, and it eats a snow tussock, which is this plant right here, by taking up a tiller and um, with its beak and then eating the um, material inside of there. And it generally will eat tussocks from lower down. Um, the red tussock is a pretty common from New Zealand. And then this is the kite diagram, which I think is very cool. Um, Peter Wiggum from um, Information Sciences at the University of Otago made this software, which you can get for free from his website, and you can make height frequency kite diagrams. So this is this, and you can see that's pretty much corresponds with what that plant is like in terms of its spatial arrangement. Um, height at 70 centimeters, and that's where it's most abundant. And then this is the Gloria site. 
in Fiordland National Park and in New Zealand. And this is Mount Burns at 1,550 meters. We didn't actually go there, but what we would find if we'd gone up there, this isn't the same mountain, but it's the Raulia species, which is also known as the vegetable sheep. And it's a huge, the larger examples of them can be over a meter across. And there's these huge cushions. And as you might know, they raise a lot of sheep in New Zealand. Um, it's in the Asteraceae. Um, and then this is some more of the Fjordland scenery where you might find Raulia. Um, and then this is the glorious site that we did actually go to. This is in the Pisa range, and this is a much more arid place. We've got some persistent snow fields at this one. Um, soluflexion lobes right here. We didn't actually go over to those, but they're pretty interesting. Um, Salmacea and gentian, many of the New Zealand wildflowers are white. Um, there are many smaller cushion plants up there. I just happened to take those pictures because they were the obvious showy ones, but there are many other species up there. And this was established in 2003, and they've resurveyed twice and have found some changes, but these glorious sites are supposed to be long term, so it's, it's early days still for what might happen. Um, this is a very wind scoured site. Um, this is looking in the other direction. There are plants here, teeny, teeny, tiny, very flat to the ground plants. Um, we were up there in the middle of the summer and had jackets and hats and gloves on just because of the wind. The temperature wasn't very low, but it was just so windy. Um, and then sheep. This is where one had died. Um, you can see there's a story in there about nutrients around um, the body of the sheep. Um, and here's the fabled snow fence. This was actually a, a pilgrimage for me as a botanist to go to this snow fence. Um, Sir Alan Mark established this in 1959. It's at 1,695 meters in the Old Man Range, which is one of the block mountain ranges in in um, the South Island of New Zealand. And that's nice. There's a snow fence with some snow. Well, a couple of things. February 5th, this is their, the middle of their summer. You can still get snow up there. Look at the differences in drift on either side. And this is from one snowstorm that came through in the middle of summer. And the idea is to look at how the presence of different snow field and scouring conditions influences plant distribution. So this is definitely what I'd call a long-term study. Um, and this is a graph from a paper published in 1986 when it was like, wow, we've been really keeping this snow field study going a long time, but now it's coming up on three decades longer than that. Um, and you see Raulia and other species, very different. Um, um, occurrence on either side of the snow fence. And there are many other papers from there. I just wanted to give you an example of that. And it's ongoing. It's not, it's not something that was going until the 1980s. It's still, there are still researchers up there. Very interesting part of the world. Um, this is Dunedin. It's on the Pacific Ocean. And this is the town where the University of Otago is. Um, the peninsula that you see receding off into the distance, that's um, the Otago Peninsula. Um, anyway, the botany department at the University of Otago is a going concern. Um, it's divided up into many different buildings, probably five or six of them, at the intersection of Great King and Union Streets. So, when you go there, you see various botanists going back and forth across Great King Street. Um, and many, many researchers from all over the place. And then I went to Scotland and looked at Great King Street in Edinburgh, Scotland. So there we are. Great King Street played a big role in my sabbatical. So why did I go to Scotland? Well, lots of reasons to go there, but in my case, it was because we were looking, we got, we, Jan Dick, um, Chris Andrews, 
Harry Polly and Alba Gutierrez and I got funding through the European Union's Interact Transact program, which funds access to Al Arctic Alpine research stations, to go there and look at a suite of plant functional traits as a sort of a pilot project for getting our ideas on plant functional traits incorporated into the Gloria project. So what we did was our project was called RAP, and I was I'm obviously not from Europe. Um, I was, I guess that's obvious, but I'm not. Um, anyway, I <laughs> got to go because I was collaborating with them but in order to get one of these Interact Transact uh, access grants in, in their sites. You have to have a European person as a project leader. So it was Hari Polly in our case. Um, anyway, we made up the acronym RAP. Researching alpine plant traits. And the idea was to look at these in situ in the lab and from the literature. We had a week and a half. What are we going to do to get this launched? So we set up a transect an elevational gradient and then inside and outside of snowfields in the Cairngorm Mountains at a mountain called Scorin Dub Moor. And it's 1,111 meters, which may not sound that high for us, but you were definitely felt like you were up in the mountains there. They come up pretty quickly out of the ocean. Um, and this is also where the Scottish Gloria High Summit is. So this is tied in with the Gloria project. So here we have this. Here's our high summit, medium, and low. And then the, the snow fields were at the mid slope place. Um, this is in the Alp. Uh, it looks like Morkaid, but it's actually pronounced Alta Vakte. I don't know how that works linguistically, but it's in the Alta Vakte catchment, which is an intensively studied and safe area, as in safe from roads being built and all sorts of other stuff. So, not very many trails. Um, walking around there for field work, very springy heather to walk on. One occasion, I was catapulted onto the ground. There I was. It's, it's a different kind of surface to walk on. There's peat, there's sphagnum, um, and um, lots of water. Uh, very different from walking around here, where you might have a granitic surface and a plant there, a plant there, and you've got to amble your way across rocks. Very different up there. Um, it's in the Cairngorms National Park, which is in the Scottish Highlands. Um, so what did we actually do here? We looked, we have some soil samples, soil pH, depth, bulk density, and then we measured, um, and we're likely going to be getting meteorological data from, they have a pretty extensive um, MET station up there. Um, plant height and lateral spread we measured in the field, and then we collected leaves and looked at length, well looked at, measured length, width, thickness, SLA, um, photographed all these so we have like records of leaf shape you know, if we've got complete leaves have they got margins all are they folded and so on um, and then distribution and frequency of plants which can give us an idea about plant associations and we did this by setting up these quadrats um, which we marked where they were so we can go back and see if they change over time um, four one meter squared quadrats for location and the, each of these quadrats had 10 centimeter times 10 centimeter subdivisions. And um, in each subdivision, we took um, presence and absence or frequency counts. And um, these are some of the species. It's not, there's not a wide array of species there. So that, that cut out a little bit of the um, labor intensiveness of it. Now, Working in the field in Scotland is a little different from here because it, the days are pretty long here in the summer, but there it just doesn't get dark until midnight-ish, and then it gets light again at 4. So we stayed out and stayed out the first day. I was like, let's stay out till 7 p.m., and I, I was worried. I don't know, the thunderstorm or the bear will get us, and then I realized, oh, it's not going to happen here. They very rarely have thunderstorms. No bears. Um, it's not going to get dark. 
So there you are. So we just stayed out. It's very nice. Um, and but these mountains can really dish it out weather-wise. We got clear weather. Um, it was still very windy. Um, but there are these cairns that have been built on the top of them, and they're you know shelter and landmarks. I, I don't see a lot of trees there. You can't really get down in the trees out of the wind very easily there. So it's not a place to underestimate. Um, and here we are near the top. It's another difference between our mountain. This is a rachometrium or a moss heath that very nice to be on. We all have waterproof trousers on because it's also you're sitting around in moss for hours. You know. um, Here's one of our quadrats. Here's Chris Andrews in the blue. Jan, the other person in blue, but she has a hood. And Alba, Therese Giron, she's from Spain. She's recently finished her PhD um, in Gloria-related work. And there's our, our frequency. See, there's our, our worksheet that we're filling out. So this is at mid-slope. Um, the picture on the lower left is um, a view of the plants outside of a snowfield. Now these are different from the Glacier Park snowfields in that they weren't there by the time we got there in July. If we had been at Glacier, we would likely still have snowfields. Um, these are called, actually should be called late snow lie areas. Um, snowfields have started melting off in Scotland. I think the first year they all melted off in the Cairngorms was 2007, and it's kind of touch and go on whether that's going to keep happening or not. And then within the snow fields, you find for the snow lie areas, the lower right picture this is typical of that, where you find a lot of um, a lot more monocots, um, Carex, Nardus strictum, um, Tricoporum, so on. And then this is just a graph of essentially what I just said, that you've got uh, fewer impetrum, which is a ericaceous shrub, which is going to thrive on those acidic, granitic soils. And nardus, the grass, increases. Um, and then lower down, we've got the Coluna vulgaris, which is the heather, um, ubiquitous plant all over the place. Well, not completely ubiquitous. So that looks like, and we've got vaccinium in there too. Um, and this is what it looks like in the Alta Vacte catchment at around 750 meters. And this is not where we sample, but I just wanted to show you this um, peat moss seep right there. Um, if some of you heard of the Spey River, S P E Y, it's famous in um, whiskey distilleries and so on. Well, this is where the water originally comes from. Um, so what, what is, where are we now in this? Well, we have heaps of data. Um, we're working on it. And so what do we know so far? Some preliminary work, we've got differences, species distribution, um, abundance and associations, and some changes in prevalence of functional traits depending on where you are, i.e. the linear monocot leaves in the snow fields. Um, and the goals of RAP, what we want to, where we want to go with this is to link the RAP results with resurvey data from summits of Scottish Gloria sites and then expand that to look with the, at the Scottish, um, New Zealand, and Montana sites. And um, that includes our site and the um, Glacier Park site. And there's another Montana Gloria site that's just recently been installed, not yet resurveyed, and that's um, um, Jennifer Lyman, that's her last name, at uh, Rocky Mountain College. Set that up in the Beartooth summer before last. And then use these wrapped and Gloria ideas and data to develop a predictive model on functional traits in, their, in alpine plants and responses to climate change. And then we'd like to put, um, as part of this, put the PFT data into the Gloria database, and then we have an alpine-specific functional traits database. So a few pictures just for fun. Um, some very old buildings in Scotland. This is a stone circle on the island of 
Lewis, the Outer Hebrides. And a castle. I have to show you a castle picture. Um, Scottish flag, the saltier right there. And then um, acknowledgments. Oh, this is the Mount Clements Moraine um, with me walking along. Um, Alice Martin, DJ, Charlie, the Jens, um, Don LaFleur, restoration ecologist up at Glacier National Park, the Alta Vacte Catchment, Gloria, NPS, um, RMCESU, EU Interact Transect. Um, actually, I've left someone out, Center for Ecology and Hydrology. That's where um, Jan Dick and Chris Andrews work in Scotland. It's near Edinburgh. And then Montana Tech. And thanks to you all for listening. And it's nice to be here today. And that's the conclusion. OK. <laughs>